Today's episode is with Kushagra Sharma. In, in general, like a security boundary is, you know, like sort of a parameter. Because some people also call it a parameter. Uh, a parameter. As I said, boundary. When you talk about boundary, it's like you know the maximum limit. Uh, it's split into different, uh, you know, subsections. It could be a monitoring baseline. It could be a preventive control baseline. It could be you know control center. And I said it before, like uh, defining the baseline is a never-ending process. So we have been. For years, we are working it today. Every it's, it's part of the everyday, uh, and then using this permission boundary, you can you can be like a bit more relaxed uh, when the migration is happening because you know you need to. But if you don't have this foundation, then you know you're going back to the whole cycle of refactoring or thinking how to deploy. And but then comes like you know this layered approach where you have flavored permission boundaries where you say, hey, for sandbox account, we have this permission boundary, or you don't have to think how you do that. You would just pass on this context to your boilerplate or the template you have, and it materializes. Hi everyone, this is Purushottam, and thanks for tuning into Scale to Zero podcast. Today's episode is with Kushagra Sharma. Kushagra is a senior platform security engineer at Booking. dot com. He has previously worked with fintech scaleups and in the consulting industry, architecting and building solutions in a hybrid cloud environment. He's a strong believer of cloud first strategy with a cloud native approach. Uh, Kushagra, welcome to the podcast. For our audience, do you want to briefly maybe share about your journey? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot, Prashantham, for uh, having me here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on this podcast. Uh, so, uh, hello, I'm Kushagra, uh, uh, working at Booking in the cloud security space right now. Uh, a, a bit about me or my background is uh, uh, initially, yes, uh, uh, I, I started more in the DevOps side of things, uh, and then sort of security came in naturally. So it was a nice transition, transi- transition from DevOps to DevSecOps, uh, which you call it in today's terms, and then you know moving to like core security, cloud security, primarily. Uh, what's interesting is like before all of this uh, e- even started, I was uh, working you know more on the IAM side of you know physical devices like turnstiles, IoT devices, and all. So security was always like sort of you know like in the back of the of the mind in in, in terms of building these solutions and also that was sort of the core. And then yeah, from scale up startups to consulting to you know uh, corporates, it, it has been like a nice transition. Lovely. And yeah, please continue. And yeah, just, yeah, just just to add to that, so uh, if you ask me, like part of it, like why the transition happened, so uh, it's it's an interesting thing because when you work in DevOps, mm-hmm. you sort of realize that security is knocking doors or like you know they're they're coming to you know embed practices. Right. So DevSecOps as I said uh, comes naturally in in there. Mm-hmm. And and then the more you dive into security or get get your hands dirty, then you know there was a curious interest to like transition totally into security. So uh, that that's how I ended up in you know in, in this role or specifically in in, in this space. Yeah, uh, the, I I can relate to it because when uh, early on the security part of the DevSecOps was primarily driven by DevOps teams. Right now we have like different roles. Uh, one focusing on DevOps, one focusing on DevSecOps, but uh, it's a very natural transition from DevOps to Dex- uh, DevSecOps as well. So, uh, yeah, um, there are more things I want to learn during the podcast from you. Uh, but before we start, we generally ask this question to all of our guests, and we get a unique answers. I'm curious, what does a day in your life look like? Okay, uh, that's an interesting one. So, I would say being in security, like not every day is the same. So every day it's a different structure, but a uh, very high level i would say yeah you, you start in the morning you you catch up with the uh, you know your slack messages your emails so you know things uh, from the previous day uh, uh, also in our team we have the concept we still have standups so even though we have a security team so we have like constant standups with the team members to see uh, what's going on mm-hmm. uh, but the ma- main part of it i would say is like you know because we uh, as part of the cloud security team we Manage baselines for public cloud. Mm-hmm. So there's a constant iteration of you know uh, what we say at as refining the baseline, which means you know adding controls, tweaking controls, reducing false positives. So this refinement of the baseline, you know, is like a never-ending process that uh, I, I would say is part of my job, part of my daily routine, uh, which, which which I like the most because you know you have different uh, sources for it, different feeds, and different things uh, showing up here and there. And at the same time, uh, we uh, we also have like quite a lot of sync. Team uh, meetings with like you know the platform teams and also, so as I said, like security sort of embedded in the whole process. So we talk a lot of with teams and it's a lot of stakeholder management at the same time. So that takes more or less uh, most of your day. Mm-hmm. And yeah, after that, you have time uh, uh, outside all of these things. You, you also like 
go on the other side of things like offensive security you know trying to like uh, look into vulnerabilities and how you can add controls to it uh, which we'll talk later during this podcast mm-hmm. so yeah uh, that that's it uh, in a nutshell yeah yeah so few things that you mentioned like security baseline or working with other stakeholders so we'll talk about those and that's what today's episode is about as well like uh, looking at security how to build security foundation and security boundaries uh, so let's get started so last year you spoke at forward cloud sec you're speaking again this year as well so in the last year's topic you presented how do you set boundaries aws permission boundaries in a large cloud environments in large cloud environments before we dig deep into the topic can you can you help our audience understand some of the basic terms like what is a security boundary and uh, particularly when it comes to cloud environments what what does it mean right uh, yeah that, that's a good call because usually like uh, different people have different definitions of things right so uh in in general like a security boundary is you know like sort of a parameter because some people also call it a parameter so it's a parameter that, that defines you know the maximum permissible permissions so it can be a network boundary so the network level permissions so it's basically defining a logical uh, separation for your cloud environment of what's the max limit that you, a user can attain now it can be at a network level at the infra level in terms of permissions so specifically the talk i gave was on more on the permission side of things that how can you set boundaries you know on the iam side so the whole boundary you can have multiple boundaries for multiple things like network boundary iam boundary and then together all of these like sort of constitute like your baseline which we'll touch upon later mm-hmm. so that's the concept of the boundary but yeah if you hear me saying parameter it's like interchangeably used with boundary as well uh makes sense so oh. but there is another term uh, term which practitioners sometimes mix up uh, while speaking with secure uh, speaking about security boundaries which is security baseline what's a security baseline right so uh, as i said boundary when you talk about boundary it's like you know the maximum limit mm-hmm. but baseline uh, with the word if you go by the literal meaning mm-hmm. uh, it's sort of like the bare minimum things that you need to have so it's sort of like a benchmark or a standard that one needs to implement I'm not talking specifically about you know security baseline in cloud environments so i would say those are like sort of the bare minimum controls that need to exist no matter what so it's sort of defining the baseline for you in the cloud okay so sort of safeguarding your resources but uh, like like you know uh, le- le- not letting you have any public exposure so on and so forth now uh, what's interesting is your boundary is sort of part of your baseline mm-hmm. because your baseline might have you know some scene configuration default configuration which you want to have by default mm-hmm. but then you also want to put like a boundary to it like what's the max a user can go in terms of permission in terms of network control so on and so forth so baseline i would say is your top level thing and like a boundary is you no know, sort of a superset or a subset of it uh, if if you may call it mm. uh i i can relate to that so last year we recorded an episode with uh, shayed uh, shayed sarif we spoke about uh, iam permissions boundary that was very specific uh, but when you speak about security boundary you touched on different areas right um, which makes sense like you would need boundary from each of these areas not just iam you would need from a network perspective from a data perspective from all the perspectives so how do you utilize the concepts of security baseline and boundary together to create a strong security foundation right so uh talking specifically about let, let's pick one one of the cloud environments like aws mm-hmm. so uh, as i said for us the boundary is you know like a subset of the overall baseline we have so what's interesting is aws has this feature called i am permission boundaries as, as you called out mm-hmm. so that's i would say like that constitutes for like a substantial part of our baseline but in the baseline you have you know default configuration that needs to go into every account so talk about you know if you talk about uh, aws specifically you know turning off the public access block ensuring no one touches it so sort of preventative controls so our baseline uh, it's split into different uh, you know subsections it could be a monitoring baseline it could be a preventive control baseline it could be you know control set you put in your ci cd pipeline like uh, the whole shift left uh, concept as you call mm-hmm. it and all of these controls are different layers together constitute your baseline so that's how you actually at the end build it so it's not just you know some specific set of controls so you know compliance check box that you need to check but you have it like on every layer you prevent certain things you monitor what you're preventing and then you have additional sort of shift lift controls where you 
sort of flag this early in the development cycle. And the whole thing together as a whole, we would call it a baseline. So uh, sometimes there's a misconception, right? Like, okay, we have these controls, we check these boxes, our baseline is ready. Mm -hmm. But how are you enforcing it? How are you monitoring it? And how are you like, like giving developers feedback early in the cycle? So uh, it's like a whole process, uh, yeah. to be honest. I, I like how you structured it. Uh, like not just applying the controls, how do you enforce, how do you monitor? Because they also play a major role, right? Uh, you have to monitor to know the effectiveness of your controls. Otherwise, as you highlighted, it's just like checking the box. You just apply to the controls and you are done. But unless you monitor, you cannot improve. And that also affects your overall security foundation in a way. Um, a a follow-up question to that is um, cloud security. One of the aspects, key aspects of cloud security is building that foundation, right? Uh, and security baseline definitely, as you highlighted, plays a major role. So, and there are many data sources which are used to define the baseline and boundary and threat intelligence is one of them. So how do you leverage threat intelligence to uh, not only define the baselines, but also continuously improve the baselines? Right. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and I said before, like, uh, defining the baseline is a never ending process. Mm -hmm. So we have been working for years. We are working it today. Every, it's, it's part of the everyday uh, uh, job, I would say. But, but to your question, so uh, as I said, like, we have this, you know, huge concept of uh, refinement of the baseline. So uh, when you talk about, you know, new AWS services, existing AWS services, or any, uh, if you talk about any cloud, they keep on adding new services. So for new services, it's easy, right? You have a new service, you evaluate it, you do threat modeling, and you, and you put it in the baseline in some, in some sort of controls. But then you have, like, you know, new features to existing services being rolled out every other day. Right. So there's a constant thing for security engineers or, or you know, your security teams to keep up with this pace. So for, for us, what's interesting is we take in a lot of feeds. So of course you, you keep up with, you know, all the public announcements and all the features getting added to it. You review the I'm namespace because most of the controls that you can sort of put in the baseline, I would say fall on the IAM side, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that's very valuable to us is review the IAM namespace. So if there's a new service XYZ, review the whole list of actions, review what actually the service can do or what are the permission sets, right? Because permission sets or the I'm permission sets would give you what the service is capable of. Right. Because in terms of services, you will just have like quite a lot lesser permission sets compared to a service that's fully configured by the end user. Mm -hmm. uh, that's like one I would say. Feed two is of course your threat detection teams, your uh, cyber detection and response teams. So a lot of prevent, like to be honest, a lot of preventative baseline that we had mm -hmm. was a reaction to what we got from our threat intel teams that hey. This is being abused. So when we talk about like I am password, for example. So back in the day, it was like very, very uncommon to like hear about this. And then suddenly there was like a huge trend of, you know, I am password being abused and how you right. can pass through it. Right. So there's a constant, you know, like feeds from different sources, like internal to the company, external to the company. People are doing great work on public uh, blogs, podcasts uh, like this one. So that's how you get to know and you sort of go with the process of refinement. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, it's feeds all together and then ends up in the baseline. Yeah, it feels like a continuous loop, right? You apply some controls, right. you monitor, and you see some attack happening or some threat uh, intel that you get from inside or outside uh, parties, and then you utilize that to improve your uh, baseline again, and then continue to monitor. So sort of like you are in a end endless loop and that helps you optimize further and further your baseline yeah precisely and uh, to add to it uh, it's also interesting or it's important to have you know internal external audits because mm -hmm. that's sort of you know a, a reality check right like not that we have a lot of findings but you sort of get to know what you know because after a, after a point of time you need fresh eyes so that's where i would say external audits are very important uh, as, as a company like be it of any size that Let's do external audit, see what they come up with, because that's sort of a, a very nice way to validate what you're doing is right, or what are the gaps, or what are potential areas of improvement. Yeah, that's a very uh, key uh, point that you have highlighted. Often, when you do internal audits, you have limited set of data, right? Sometimes, and you you might see that your baselines are perfect based on that. So, doing that external audit helps you gives a, gives you a different perspective. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, now. 
another question that comes to my mind is, uh, let's say you have defined the baseline. Uh, it's not just you, right? There is a team which does this work. And then it, often it falls under the security team that, hey, the security team will define the baselines, boundaries, and all of that. But it helps to build a culture where not only the security, but also the engineering team is aware of what you are doing and they understand the impact of it. So beyond some of these technical controls or setting up the baseline, how can you like promote a culture of security within the organization? Yeah, uh, th that's a very uh, good question. And I think most organizations struggle with, you know, bridging this gap uh, in terms of building the culture. So, so for me, what's important is that, uh, as I always say, security shouldn't be an afterthought, right? Mm -hmm. So earlier the development teams involve security, the better it is. So one of the easiest way that, that uh, I could think of is that, like, you know, we have architecture reviews and so on and so forth. And it's always a trend that, you know, the security should be there. Mm -hmm. It could be that you don't have any inputs and, you know, it's like a very golden path architecture, but still having security, you know, in those meetings, in those alignments, in those sync calls and reviews really helps. So for, for me, what's also important is that, you know, security shouldn't be a gray area that, hey, you have this finding, resolve it. But you should also like sort of have like internal awareness programs where you tell how this is being built. Hmm. So for example, uh, at booking.com, we publish, you know, all the controls that we have per service, per cloud provider to end users saying, hey, these are the controls that would apply to your environment. This is how we are doing it. This is what it's actually checking. So it's not like a black box area. Hey, you need to fix this. Go to your ISC repository, change this permission to this. But you're actually telling them what the underlying issue is. And that's how, you know, the knowledge transfer sort of moves a bit on the shift left direction because developers would know, hey, this is a problem. So the next time when they do the same thing, they'll have better understanding for it. Right. So be as open as you can, mm -hmm. uh, involve security uh, the early as possible, even if your PO is saying it doesn't matter you know, if you have production ready design. So I, I think that really helps and builds a culture and it gives like a quite good benefits in the long run. Yeah, the, the key word that I got from your answer is early, right? Engage with the security team early rather than once everything is ready, you want to roll it out and that's when you bring in the security team. It would also give a feeling that uh, I, one, you are not valuing security that much. And the second thing is the opinion that you will get from security, you would feel like it's a roadblock, right? To your uh, new feature that you want to roll out. So in like collaborating with the security team early has a lot of benefits uh, as I'm reading from your response. Um, okay. One of the things that you highlighted in the earlier response is that uh, security is not a one-time thing. You have to uh do it in a continuous manner you initially define you monitor you improve on it and another thing that you highlight i'm just trying to connect two dots right another thing that you highlighted is these cloud providers they roll out new services um every every month or new features uh, for existing services now let's say you have a you have defined a security baseline uh aws rolls out a new service or a new feature in an existing service and that doesn't align with your security baseline. How do you handle those situations? Right. So uh, uh, in, in here, I think uh, the permission boundaries, uh, specifically talking about, so let's pick uh, AWS really help. Sure. Because what we do is we follow like, you know, like a safe list approach. So for example, here are the list of 50, 100 services mm -hmm. that are permitted to be used in our cloud environment or, or let's say in production environment, right? Mm -hmm. So this way you're not building a mechanism where you say, hey, deny these services, but allow the rest. Because if you say deny these services, allow the rest, you're even allowing the new services without them right. being passed through the whole security review cycle, right? right? So this way you sort of control of what you're permitting. So that's step one. Step two is when you control of what you're permitting, mm -hmm. you can easily do threat modeling of the service itself, add controls and, you know, see how good your coverage is and what's the risk profile associated with that services. Because some services might be, you know, just feature additions, they might not have any security implications at all. So this way, there's always a parity with your baseline to the service being permitted to your cloud environment, right? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you will end up in like sort of a health situation where, you know, things are getting added, they are being permitted, they are being deployed, and you have no idea of what's going on in your cloud environment. Mm -hmm. So I think this approach really helped us. But also sometimes what happens is now, if you allow like a specific IAM namespace or any service, and new features are getting added, mm -hmm. then you need to go back to the retro 
retrospectively, you know, review the service of what's done, what's not, uh, uh, what's in scope back then, and then keep on refining the baseline. So that's why it's very important, you know, that it's not that once you've reviewed a service, full stop, we are secured, but you need to keep on seeing, okay, did, did any of the things change? Did any of the new things get added to the same service? Because it's like an ongoing process. So you should have review cycles for the same service, for example, or, or, or to your baseline. So that also links back to the same thing where we say, you need to review the controls you have. So you need to see if they're working or not, right? Yeah. Because sometimes there might be a control and it, you know, it's obsolete, things got deprecated and it's not no longer doing what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So this whole testing mechanism should also exist uh, in, in parallel. So you can catch things early rather than like it being an audit finding later on that this this is a gap or like a coverage issue. Hmm. Uh, I I like the inclusion based approach, uh, like as you highlighted, right? That allowing services uh, only a list of services rather than saying that deny services. That that way you have more granular control on which services are being uh, allowed to let's say your developers or the engineering team. Do you guys use SCPs to define these, or you guys have uh, you guys use more IAM granular permission sets? Right. So uh, in, in this case, we use uh, permission boundary uh, actually. Uh, but what's interesting is that you might ask that, hey, if you're allowing services, you are sort of blocking, you know, the experimentation part of it. So what if a developer wants to test out a service, a new service, right? But then it has to go through all these processes, and these processes might take time, right? So uh, uh, what I spoke about at Fort CloudSec was also that we sort of have a mechanism of flavored permission boundaries, mm -hmm. where we build dynamic permission boundaries on the fly. Okay. And these boundaries can be built at a per organization unit level, per account level, or you name it. So for example, today, if a dev wants to try something, you know, in pre-product dev environment, we can build or allow like a service or custom actions just for that specific account on the fly. Mm. And, and it's not that they need to reach out to us, you know, and we do something, we tweak the permission boundary, it's all via infrastructure as code. So they can raise a uh, MR, the repositories available to the company. They raise it, we review it, and it goes through the whole change management process and it gets deployed. Hmm. So that's what I said, like removing the gray area part of security where, you know, security is doing things for people. You, you need to empower developers. So using this way, you know, uh, we use permission boundaries for services, but to your point as well, SCPs, we use it also for, you know, what we call it as non-negotiable controls. Mm. So things where you don't anticipate any deviation, any exception whatsoever, like totally non-negotiable, that goes into the SCP for us. Mm. And things, you know, where you need flexibility or you anticipate there would be exceptions or, you know, things changing constantly and, you know, constant iteration of deployment cycles that you put into the permission boundary and sort of finding the balance between these two. Because at the end, both of these are preventative controls, right? Right, right. So you have a good balance between uh, SCPs where you have a hard no, in a way, uh, and you have the dynamic uh, aspects of the permission sets where somebody, someone can experiment, or you can move fast in a way. You don't have to wait for maybe a week for someone to approve that you want to use a new service, something like that. Uh, so that helps right. you with scale, right? Um, any other such practices that you have seen other practitioners use to uh, sort of not become a roadblock for your core business uh, teams. Right. So uh, recently I heard about, you know, someone building dynamic SCPs uh, in a similar manner, right? So sort of interchangeably using the same methodology or the concept. But, you know, what they were doing is they were building dynamic SCPs and attaching it to per account level. And they had like a whole uh, new based UI where, you know, developers can request access and they can tell the use case it goes through like a whole flow, which was very impressive, uh, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So at the end, I think it's more about, uh, you know, letting your developers know that there's a process mm -hmm. and this is how it's done because uh, we also have, you know, these environments called a sandbox or, you know, uh, testing environments where, you know, you have the complete freedom to, you know, test things out. And uh, of course, uh, they don't have any access outside that specific, uh, you know, uh, boundary that we have built, but that also helps them, you know, to, to move, move fast. So uh, a lot of, uh, I think, uh, Practitioners also have this concept of, you know, separate org for, you know, testing and like all of these uh, proof of concepts or, you know, uh, sandbox environments, which is, I think, a good thing because you're separating the whole tenant altogether. So you have different orgs or different account groups for it altogether, which I, I think is a, another good approach. But at the same time, I, I, I see the overhead of, you know, governing two organizations or two account groups. Mm. So then I would say like logical separation, which most of the customers are using, either using SAPs dynamic SCPs permission boundary uh, uh, really adds to the value. 
But yeah, so another thing uh, which I was about to mention is that also sometimes it could be that you know uh, you need to move fast and SCPs and permission boundaries might not be the way. Mm-hmm. So I'm saying this because sometimes you don't have you know the granular level of things which you can implement using these policies because you don't have condition key support or you don't have constraint support, for example. Mm-hmm. So in this case, what's also useful, which I see a lot of people doing, include, including us, is you know leveraging infrastructure as code checks. So put it in the deployment pipeline because ideally you have a single deployment pipeline to deploy into cloud. If you don't, then you have another problem to tackle. But given you have that, then you can put the checks, you know, sort of flagging early in the dev cycle. Hey, this is a warning. It's being permitted in dev or sandbox environment. But when you move to prod, this would be a hard no. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this way you also give them feedback early in the cycle, but you have different ways and, you know, you're not just relying on SCPs, IAM, permission boundary, you have different ways to implement controls because I think that's important if you want to also be cloud agnostic where you need to sort of move outside from the cloud pane and have controls which you can implement using other mechanisms. So dynamic SCP, I have never uh, honestly seen anyone use that in practice, but I'm glad that you highlighted that because most of the uh, practitioners I have spoken with, they define the SCP like a hard no, whatever is not allowed and then use more granular controls for managing within an organization unit or within an account. But uh, yeah, I I definitely give it a try, like how we can leverage the dynamic SCP. Uh, And you also highlighted like how to define the baselines at different levels, right? Org levels or organization unit level, or even at an account level, if you want the flexibility um, uh, so that you are not impacting the developer's productivity. Uh, which is a key aspect, right? When it because business, the core purpose of business is to roll out new capabilities, and uh, enabling the development team to move fast uh, helps everyone. So now, as like all most of us nowadays follow agile processes, right? Uh, scrums and agile processes, and as you become a larger organization, that means more and more frequent deployments. Uh, you mentioned that you use, let's say, uh, infrastructure. You, we, like uh, practitioners can use infrastructure as code to define not only the resources, but also the permission boundaries. Um, let's say a, uh, an enterprise customer has not only cloud, but also has le- uh, legacy cloud deployments. What, what strategies would you uh, recommend so when they are migrating so that they define the permissions boundaries in the right way? Right. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think that's a challenge for uh, almost every enterprise, every customers, you know, because uh, when they start building security wasn't, you know, the primary focus, but now it is right. And then the environment that you have currently is sort of the legacy environment, right? Because controls were not applied, so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. So uh, what's what, what's like a approach to that would be, uh, as I said, you know, we have different flavors of the permission boundary. And the primary reason for that was, you know, because we have different regulatory or compliance scopes, but also not in every environment is the same, right? So my environment is not your environment. Every, every company has like different environments and they serve different purposes. So using these, uh, flavored permission boundaries, as we call it, you can actually, you know, have a completely different permission boundary for a specific environment, like be it your legacy environment or something that's very, very different use case, like be it a regulatory requirement as well. And then using this permission boundary, you can you can be like a bit more relaxed uh, when the migration is happening because you know you need to move things a bit on the other side of the cloud. But as you start to like move accounts, then you need to you know sort of go into the refinement cycle to make it uh, more and more stricter to you know to cater to the re- controls or the requirements you have in place. Mm-hmm. So that's what I meant by flexibility when it comes to permission boundaries because you know you can be as flexible in terms of what's the maximum permissible limit, right? And if there's a business case for your legacy environment to be migrated, then uh, th- that's a way forward, right? Because you can have like uh, retros later on to, you know, to like see what areas could be improved. But at the same time, because I, I was also doing a lot of on-premise to cloud uh, migration. And one of the things uh, like back in the day was, you know, you never do lift and shift, you know, <laughs> y- you should also see what the cloud capabilities are right. or what you can like leverage from managed services, so on and so forth. But I, I get sometimes there's a business requirement to do lift and shift, which is totally fine. But I would say the key part is also, you know, to refactor of how your environment maps to the cloud you're migrating to or where you're moving the uh, your whole infrastructure set up to. Yeah. 
So uh, again, it's a matter of you know flexibility. You having the capability to deploy it. Uh, as I said, like one of the core foundation before even you start like listing down the controls that you want to have is having centralized deployment mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So how do you deploy to accounts at scale, right? Because it's very easy when you have just a couple of accounts, account groups, so on and so forth. But for an organization, for example, like us, we have an excess of like two two thousand AWS accounts, for example. Wow. How do you start talking to them, right? So these core building blocks, I, I think, are more more important questions for you to you know start building the foundation, and then when you have challenges like these, you can like quickly deploy at scale and you know tweak things around. But if you don't have this foundation, then you know you're going back to the whole cycle of refactoring or thinking how to deploy and. It, it triggers, you know, like you're sort of back to like square one from scratch, you know, what to do and where to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like how you defined that, um, like, let's say you are moving from on-prem to a cloud. Um, ideally, you should not do left and script because cloud has different set of capabilities. Uh, of course, there are some related capabilities. There are some unique capabilities that you should be aware of. But at the same time, uh, if there is a business demand or something like that. It's okay to implement. Uh, it's okay to follow lift and shift, but as long as you set some good security baselines. Um, another thing that I, I got from your response is there is no one size fits all security baseline for every account. Your sandbox might have a different requirement versus your QA versus your production. Um, usually the response that we get from practitioners is, well, the security baseline depends on um, many things. So my question to you is, is it possible to create a one size fits all security baseline for a cloud environment? Let's say um, I'm running a company, we have 10 AWS accounts. Um, do you see a possibility where I can have one uh, security baseline versus having different set of security baselines? Right. So, yeah, I, I remember I, I used this term, how, how you can build a one size fits all, uh, like baseline or boundary in, in the past. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my approach to this is, you know, it, it has to be a layered, layered approach, right? So when I speak about having a baseline, uh, when I spoke about SAPs, for example, in terms of AWS, so I, I mentioned these are like non-negotiable controls, hard no. Yeah. So no matter which environment you're talking about, these needs to apply, right? Mm -hmm. So that sort of goes back, goes back to your, you know, so say global level baseline, mm -hmm. no matter what it applies to all the accounts in your org. But then comes like, you know, this layered approach where you have flavored permission boundaries, where you say, hey, for sandbox account, we have this permission boundary. For for example, if an account is falling under PCI scope, you have this specific permission boundary. So the point being with one size fits all is that you shouldn't, you know, reinvent the wheel to have different mechanisms to have this baseline ready. There should be, you know, a standard deployment mechanism for us to start with and like sort of a boilerplate. So what we do is we have the same template, same boilerplate for permission boundaries, mm -hmm. but based on you know, the context that you get like inputs, which environment it's going to be deployed into, which account it is, uh, whether it's, you know, if it's a legacy environment, if you have one. And then it dynamically generates a permission boundary for that specific uh, account or, you know, uh -huh. account group, for example. Okay. So the thing is, you know, the template or the boilerplate that you have is sort of one size fits all. So now if a business requirement there is tomorrow, you know, to onboard a completely new uh, environment or environment that falls under a regulatory scope, mm -hmm. you don't have to think how you do that. You would just pass on this context to your boilerplate or the template you have, mm -hmm. and it materializes. Right? Mm -hmm. So in this, we have a sort of one size fits all boundary. So the boundary is differs from environment to environment. And on the top level, you have sort of this global baseline monitoring all accounts, preventing actions on account, like the, the whole monitoring and preventative baseline that applies to everything. So these are like sort of the non-negotiable. Hmm. So it's, it's more of how you approach it because I've, I've seen like uh, some, some customers or some companies, for example, building, you know, siloed different permission boundaries. And after a point when you have 10 different versions of it, <laughs> 10 different deployment mechanisms and different ways of how the controls are managed, then it sort of goes into like something that's not maintainable, right? Right. So uh, again, back to your whole foundation of how you designed the baseline and how how, how you how you thought about it. Right, right. And uh, having a layered approach uh, uh, gives you a lot of flexibility, right? Like global versus uh, context specific sandbox or QA. You have different uh, baselines, and also uh, no, it helps you group maybe your environments together. 
If you have 10 sandbox environments, maybe apply the global plus a sandbox specific baseline. If you have a QA, you have a, you apply a different group, but it's, you still have a common sort of security baseline that you can apply rather than creating one for every single account. As you highlighted, it's not maintainable after maybe five or 10 accounts. If you have, let's say, 1,000 accounts, there is no way you can manage it. Uh, one baseline per account, right? Yeah, precisely. So last question on this is, um, any other recommendations that you have in terms of finding a balance between the standardization and also any specific security requirements that maybe a growing startup can utilize? Right. So for growing companies, I would suggest that, you know, there are quite a lot of, you know, benchmarks there, uh, which you can find online, like you can talk about NIST, CIS benchmarks, and so on and so forth. So when you're building the baseline, you don't start, you know, thinking about everything. You think about, you know, the core foundation things that your security policy needs to have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the standards you want to implement? So if you talk about, you know, encryption at default, MFA for users, like the very basic things, right? right. You start listing them down from these standards, right? Mm -hmm. So also another, like when I talk about this, that you list the standards in a very generic way is also because later down the line, you might want to follow a cloud agnostic approach. You don't want to, you know, limit your controls to a specific cloud provider, right? Mm -hmm. So you start listing down the controls for the requirements, like these uh, standards or benchmarks, which you have are, are a great starting point. And then you think, okay, which are the ones that, you know, sort of need to have like sort of going to your, your non-negotiable control set. So you have risk teams as well. If you don't, then you can sort of, you know, get the uh, inspiration from these benchmarks to start with. And then that's, you know, you know the, your version 0 0.1 of the baseline, mm -hmm. which you can sort of implement. So it's, it's a, uh, ever going iteration where you know start small and then you sort of go into the direction where you are very granular because you also get experience of what you know but it's very important you know to have these things uh, from the get-go mm -hmm. because if you don't and implement or you start implementing these controls later down the line then you're breaking you know production workflows you're like you're going back into the iterative cycles of redeploying things so on and so forth so that's not you know a good developer experience and it would waste more you know work hours than you would do if you did it right from the get-go. Right, right. So yeah, like these benchmarks, I think we use them a, a lot initially back in the day, you know, to like start with the very foundation baseline. Like I think from 10 controls, you'll multiply 200 like over the years, but those 10 are the, you know, the foundation of the whole baseline. Right, right. Uh, one of the things that you highlighted earlier is uh, you should not just think about a particular cloud, right? Uh, what if you, your workloads are you know, spanning across multiple clouds? So we got a question from Don Edwards from AWS, uh, which was around multi-cloud uh, multi setup. So the question is, when designing security architectures that work across multiple clouds, what parts should be common across all of them? And what parts should be designed for each specific platform? Okay, uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So uh, I would say if you have like a multi-cloud architecture, Again, these generic requirements, which are non-negotiable, mm -hmm. which are not, which are cloud agnostic, needs to be enforced everywhere. Uh, now, if, because a lot of people confuse implementation versus what the requirement is, right? Mm -hmm. So how you implement something on AWS might be completely different from how you implement the same control on GCP. Right. But that's a complete problem on the implementation there, right? right? But the first thing for which needs to happen is map out the requirements, which are non-negotiable, and they should apply to everything as I said, like encryption by default, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Second step is that before you even go to the implementation side of things, see if these things can be built in. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to have like controls, you know, to sort of enforce it. Look into default configurations or, you know, providing launch paths to developers where they can use like, you know, modules which have these defaults in build. So you're sort of like, again, shifting left. Mm -hmm. And then to very specific cloud things. Uh, so as I said, like, Every cloud provider works in a very different manner. They have completely different uh, IAM terminologies right. and how the authorized authentication layer works. But again, here, the first step before you even think about this is, you know, you need to have a very good visibility into your whole cloud footprint. So uh, asset management, mm -hmm. you should be able to query every asset and know its configuration. I think that's one of the core foundation, which most people miss that you need to have a good, very good, very, very good asset inventory to start with. Yeah. And once you have that, then you can think about specific controls targeting services because one service from AWS would be very different from how it's working on GCP. And these specific, you know, cloud specific things, you can then put it to your baseline 
which is very cloud specific and not you know cloud agnostic. So uh, again, sort of the global baseline concept. The layered architecture. So, so, the, the layered approach, yeah. right? Because yeah, again, in here you cannot have a one size fits all approach, but you can deploy things using a one size fits all boilerplate or mechanism that you have, right? Yeah. So last year uh, at Forward Cloud, like uh, Kesson Broughton, I think he did a session on uh, inventory, uh, and that session was focused on GCP. But uh, he was highlighting that uh, your asset inventory plays a major role when it comes to security. Because if you don't know what assets you have, what is public, what is uh, what can be attacked, you cannot secure them. And you highlighted that as well, right? Like if you are in a multi-cloud environment, right. follow the layered approach, but at the same time, you need to understand what are your uh, assets across all of them so that you can apply these security baselines. Right, indeed. I think visibility is like one of the core components. and. To be honest, a lot of controls that uh, I've designed in the past, I, I looked at uh, resources deployed, which are insecure, mm -hmm. look at the configuration and do the reverse engineering, you know, to build control around it. Right. So if you have visibility, you, you know, you have this, these data points, you know, to like do the reverse side of things rather than thinking from the other side, which, which really helps, I think. Mm -hmm. So yeah, indeed, as you said, visibility is the key and asset inventory, you know, uh, yeah, Please it, 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 it proves more. Than that sounds, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, precisely. Uh, and so that's a great way to end the security questions section. Thank you so much, Kushagra, for the engaging conversation. Here are a few points that stood out for me. The first one is security baseline along with security boundaries help or define a security foundation for organization. And there are various types of security baselines organizations should uh, incorporate, like network, IAM, infrastructure, and data. The second one is baselining is a continuous process. Uh, it's not a one, once, uh, set it up once and forget it type of a process. Uh, define it, measure it, monitor it, and refine it using internal and external audits and their findings. The last one is there is no one size fits all security baseline. However, uh, define grouped and layered baselines. Let's say one at a global level, then one for maybe sandbox environments, one for production environments so that you can scale your security practices in organizations and still be uh, able to uh, like maintain it properly. Thank you. Uh, the next section is around rating security practices. The way it works is I'll share a, a, a security practice and you need to rate it from one to five, five being the best. And you can add context why you think, uh, why you gave a particular rating. So let's start with the first one. Develop and regularly test an incident response plan to help quickly detect, respond to, and recover from security incidents. I would say that's a five. Okay. Uh, the reason I, I say it's a five is because, uh, as I touched upon earlier, that you need to be on top of things that you're implementing. So you need to test them if they're working fine. But at the same time, you need to have like processes of, mm -hmm. or of how you go about it. Right? So it's not a one-time thing or something that you do proactively. So having these incident response plans, playbooks, processes really help. And like, e even if you don't have like a real incident, it's always good to you know, run these tabletop exercises to, you know, see how your cloud is uh, reacting to it. If your tooling that you have, because you also have a lot of external tooling, how they are reacting to it, if your, all your integrations are working fine. Because at times, these exercises lead to, you know, finding gaps in your whole integration cycle. So it's very important, you know, to have a constant iteration of these things happening. Mm. Because uh, also what's interesting is we sort of measure as well, you know, how quickly you, you were able to detect or how quickly our tools were able to detect it. And that time can grow significantly over time or it can like reduce. So it's very important to have constant iteration where you measure these things, right? Right. So not only that you have this is, but you also have data points or you measure it for like post-mortem exercises. So uh, that's why it's like, I would say it's a must uh, for organization of any size. Like if you're smaller, then it's like easier. I would say if you're bigger, then it takes time, but it's definitely uh, worth the time spent. Yeah, agree. Uh, it, it adds a lot of value. Again, it goes back to that continuous improvement process, right? Uh, right? The next one is always lock your computer when you leave your desk, even if it's just for a short time. So I, I thought that it has become like a habit for folks, but what's your take on this? 
Right. I, I, I mean, yeah, I would again give it a five because I think this is like more of like, you know, a very useful thing or very basic security know-how that everyone needs to follow, right? Uh, I, I mean, I, I think every company, if you have like, you know, security awareness training when you join or you do the onboarding, I think this is present everywhere that, hey, lock your computer. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's not that, not like, uh, uh, because if you're in public space and all, and if you have your laptop open, there might be consequences and right. we have had incidents like that. Right. The reason I'm giving it a five, like also we have this thing uh, at our company, which is called the cake culture. Mm -hmm. So if your laptop is open and your peer finds it open, uh, you need to get the cake the next day as like, you know, sort of a <laughs> violation of that. Uh, in the companies, we have to wear like a bunny coat uh, and, you know, be ashamed in the office the whole day. So oh. uh, I think it again, it's down to the security awareness and uh, it, it's a must. So uh, again, a five. <laughs> that That's a funny way to remind folks to not leave their laptop on internet, uh, like log their laptops. <laughs> uh, well, trust me, you wouldn't uh, that bunny coat uh, <laughs> uh, again. It's a you remember for life. <laughs> the, now, the last one is DevOps practices are needed to move fast and deploy code to production. Security practices are not the most important right now. Yeah. Uh, the, the lowest is one, right? So yeah, <laughs> I, I think uh, I, I would go extreme because uh, as I said, security shouldn't be an afterthought, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, involve early, even if it's you know, like a POC. Mm -hmm. uh, also like some, some people have, as I said, like if you want flexibility or experimentation headspace, uh, build environments for developers, you know, like sandbox environments, uh, pre prod, like which is very straight, no network access as such, where they can experiment things freely. Hmm. So it's more of, you know, finding the middle ground between developers and security to let you do that. But using that as a premise of, you know, deploying into production without security practices, I think is like a very uh, frowned upon and bad practice in general. So uh, definitely, uh, uh, there are ways it's more of, you know, communicating between teams to find the middle ground and, you know, build a safe environment where they can experiment. So you don't hamper the velocity, but at the same time, uh, you're not exposing uh, your company resources. Right, right. Um, makes sense. And before we end the podcast, uh, last question that I'd like to ask is any reading recommendation that you have for our audience? It can be a blog or a book or a podcast or anything. Okay. Uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reading this book. I'm halfway through uh, uh, right now. So it's it's called uh, I Split the Difference. Uh, it's by Chris uh, Voss. Uh, and and it's not security related. So it's it's more talking about, you know, negotiations and how you handle them in like high crisis situation because the uh, author is like a former FBI agent and he used to integrate, uh, uh, interrogate people. Uh, the reason why I'm saying that is like uh, it has a very nice uh, concept where he talks about, you know, the power of saying no because there's always this notion, security said no, right? <laughs> so it, 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 like there's always like a space between a yes and no. There's always like some space of like, you know, finding the middle ground, as I said. Right. But saying no leads to discussions or engagements. And that's how you reach the space between, you know, yes and no. So it's, it's a very good book, you know, to uh, like for your real, for your like personal life, but also for your professional life of how you do stakeholder management because security is a lot of stakeholder management. Hmm. So I, I think that's a very good read. I'm still halfway through, but uh, I definitely recommend it. Hmm. Oh, I think you said that it's not related to security, but I feel like it is because what you highlighted, right? As a security right. uh, team member, you need to speak with different stakeholders and uh, finding that uh, balance between saying yes and no, finding the uh, right path is also a key skill you need to have. Uh, so even though it is not directly related to security, but I still feel it's part of right. how a day-to-day -day life of a security engineer or security practitioner. Yeah, but definitely, I totally agree. And, and I think it has really good lessons for, you know, people in any part of the career. Like if you're early in the career, then I think it's really valuable, you know, to see uh, how human reacts to, you know, know and how, how you can like uh, go about it. Yeah. So it's a very valuable lesson. And uh, as I said, like skill development uh, at the end. Mm -hmm. So when we uh, when we'll upload the uh, uh, episode, we'll make sure to tag uh, this uh, recommendation so that our audience can go and uh, they can also read and learn from it. Uh, so with that, we come to the end of the podcast. So thank you so much, Kushagra, for joining and sharing your learning with us. Yep, uh, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure speaking with you and it was a really a very interesting discussion. I loved it. Uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. 
and for our audience thank you so much for watching see you in the next episode thank you